It was the 8th of May, 1945, the day war in Europe ended, and the start of the biggest party in history. Half a million people poured into central London. You know, generally mayhem, <laughs> but, but a rather nice mayhem. All eyes were on the royal family, on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. The king and queen were proudly flanked by Princess Elizabeth in uniform and her younger sister, Princess Margaret. But no one suspected that the two princesses were busy hatching an extraordinary plan. Of course, what she wanted to do was to go out and see what it was like. For one glorious night, the future queen was about to slip out of the palace and join her people on the streets. Now, for the first time, the friends and family with her that night will reveal what happened hour by hour. Well, it was just freedom to be an ordinary person. We'll even hear from the Queen herself as she recalls what happened with real emotion in a rare interview. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. But this was a night without rules where anything could happen. Piles of burnt deck chairs in Green Park and condoms in all the bushes. For the future queen, this night was to be a rite of passage. Basically, the entirety of the princess's youth, university life, the time to be free and do whatever you want, compressed into one small night, and that was VE night. In this film, we'll take you on a guided tour of VE Day, street by street, in the company of the Queen and her sister, as they traveled incognito through the crowds. It's a story that provides a unique insight into Elizabeth and Margaret and the very different people they were to become on the night they let their hair down and parted with the people. By May 1945, Britain had suffered nearly six long years of war. Over a third of a million British people had lost their lives. Three quarters of a million families had seen their homes destroyed. Thousands of grieving women had lost husbands and sons. The country was desperate for the news that finally came at 3 p.m. on the 8th of May. Yesterday morning, at 2.41 a.m., General Jodel and Admiral Dönitz signed the act of unconditional surrender. The German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. A week after Hitler's death, the country was finally allowed to celebrate. But there were no church bells, no sirens, no organized celebrations. People flooded into London anyway, determined to have the night of their lives. Margaret Rhodes is the Queen's cousin and close friend. On VE Day, she was living at Buckingham Palace and was one of a select group who accompanied the future Queen on her night out. The whole thing was so exciting. We were all so excited that the war was over. Just being part of this huge celebration feeling. You just imbibed the wonder of it all. 
1945, Margaret and the future queen covered the route on foot. Now, at 89, she's retracing their steps in the back of a 1939 Lagonda sports car. Well, I don't think they realized who was amongst the party. I think they just thought were a lot of rather drunk young mad people. <laughs> Nineteen-year-old Princess Elizabeth and fourteen-year-old Princess Margaret had spent most of the war at Windsor Castle, protected from the bombs and blitz of London. As a devoted father, King George VI was understandably anxious that his daughters were well protected. He used to say, Lilibet is my pride and Margaret is my joy. Um, he was very proud of his elder daughter and uh, she as a person had a sort of seriousness of character that uh, he responded very well to because he wanted to be a good constitutional monarch and it was quite clear that she did too. And as for Princess Margaret, um, she was such a beautiful child that he just used to gaze at her in adoration, couldn't believe that he had created this vision of beauty. I think in many ways they were thought of as a, as a pair. Two little girls, they did everything together. They were very close indeed and they stayed very close. In the book that she wrote, the little princesses, their governess, Crawfy, said it was not to be thought that they were always little angels because they would fight fisticuffs with one another. Princess Elizabeth apparently had quite a good left hook and Princess Margaret, being much smaller, would throw herself in, kicking and biting and all the rest of it. But as heir to the throne, Elizabeth had clearly been marked out as special. Elizabeth was educated as would befit a future queen. She was taught constitutional history. She went to the headmaster of Eton. She was given a much broader based education. I think Princess Margaret was very envious of the fact that Princess Elizabeth was getting this uh, special treatment, these lessons from the headmaster of Eton. She'd done so much with her older sister, and now suddenly she was being barred from it. Elizabeth may have been destined for the throne, but she was eager to join the war effort alongside the rest of the country. At an MT training center, Princess Elizabeth, now a second subaltern in the ATS, has been on a three weeks course of instruction. Towards the latter stages of the war, she'd been allowed to join the Auxiliary Territorial Service, known as the ATS. It was the women's branch of the British Army. Princess Elizabeth had pushed very much. She wanted to do her best, and she was very proud of being in uniform with the ATS. And because Elizabeth had been in the ATS, she very much felt herself to be one of the ordinary people. The ATS girls were out there. Why shouldn't she be there too? VE Day began as an ordinary May Tuesday. Many people set off for work before turning back as they were given the day off. For the first time in six years, the wartime ban on the weather forecast was lifted. With temperatures predicted to reach 75 degrees Fahrenheit, thousands decided to make for central London. By seven in the evening, crowds had massed outside Buckingham Palace all hoping for a glimpse of the royal family. But inside the palace, anxiety was mounting. The king had to make a live broadcast to the nation. Something of an ordeal for a man struggling to control a serious stammer. Germany, the enemy who drove all Europe into war has been finally Overcome. His speech over, the king now faced another challenge as his daughters sought permission to leave the palace and join the crowds outside. Elizabeth was already fascinated by what was going on down there. She said she was looking at the lights, looking at the people and wondering what they were all doing down there. I think the king was put under 
a great deal of pressure from both the daughters to be allowed to, to go out and mingle with the crowds and celebrate. The entire war, Elizabeth had been at Windsor Castle. She hadn't been to the theater. She'd hardly been to a cinema. She'd hardly been to London, apart from a trip to the dentist. So she was really um, naive about life, which worried her father. He, he thought, she's had such a difficult time, poor girl. You know, she hasn't had any fun. He wanted, he wanted his daughter to have fun. The princesses kept asking, and finally the king relented. a very one-off kind of occasion, which is why I think it was so clever of, of their parents, of the king and queen, to realize that you know, you, they needed to send their children out into the, into the wide open night to experience this, this one-off moment of, of life when the world was, war was over. The king may have given his permission for the girls to leave, but he wasn't going to allow them out alone. So a group of 16 trusted members of the royal household was hastily assembled. It's unbelievable now to think that the king let his two daughters, the heir to the throne and the second, go out into the streets where there was drunkenness, fighting, pickpocketing, all kinds of crime, prostitution, it was all out there. And he just said, okay girls, off you go. But as Elizabeth prepared to leave the palace, she began to have second thoughts. In a rare radio interview given years later, her fears at coming face to face with the public are clear. I remember we were terrified of being recognized. So I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. A grenadier officer amongst our party of about 16 people said, he refused to be seen in the company of another officer improperly dressed. So I had to put my cap on normally. Finally, at around 9 p.m., Princess Elizabeth and the rest of the royal party slipped through the palace gates and plunged into the night. For the first time, they were free. They began their adventure by joining the crowd clamoring for the king and queen on the other side of the palace railings. You crossed the forecourt in Buckingham Palace and got to the railings and the gates, and now there were these masses, masses of people. I mean, there was a general thing of we want the king and queen shouting which we all practically joined in with. And were amazed when about five or ten minutes later the windows things opened and they came out on the balcony. And so we shouted even louder. The future queen, along with her sister Margaret and their cousin Margaret Rhodes, turned away from the palace and headed through the crowds. I mean, it was like a, a wonderful escape, really, for the girls. I didn't think they'd ever been out you know, amongst thick crowds and walked, walked with a million other people. Princess Elizabeth and her friends had a long night ahead of them. Their party was just getting started. It was just freedom to be an ordinary person.
At 9.30 p.m. on VE Day, the future Queen Elizabeth was out on the town in London with her sister, 14-year-old Princess Margaret. Celebrating the end of the war with them was their cousin, Margaret Rhodes. I mean, the crowds to me, I, I, I can remember vividly the feeling of the people pressing on one. And again, it was a seething mass of humanity. The future queen found herself in the midst of people from all walks of life, all throwing themselves into spontaneous celebrations. It was a scene of glorious chaos. There was Humphrey Littleton going by on the back of a lorry with him playing his trumpet like mad in the back, which was just wonderful. I think people, if they had musical instruments, they played them. You know, if you had a trumpet, you played it. The spirit of pure happiness that we could live again. We could really, we were all going to live. And we were all going to live forever at that time, we thought, you know. Around 10 p.m., having danced down the entire length of the Mall, the royal party took a detour through Horse Guards Parade. The Queen would later recall the moment vividly. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. I just remember the crowds and the sort of feeling of wonderful joy. Which was, um, which was such a change, <laughs> you know, after five years of gloom, somehow. For one night only, pubs were allowed extended opening hours. Many reported running out of beer early in the evening. Some people were a bit plastered, some people were very plastered, and others were dead sober, but having a really good time. The princesses were determined to join in with the spirit of the moment. As the Queen was happy to recall, they weren't above playing pranks on unsuspecting members of the crowd. I also remember when someone exchanged hats with a Dutch sailor, a poor man coming along with us in order to get his cap back. <laughs> her whole life so far has been one of quiet, gentle repression, and her future is going to be one of nothing but decorum. You can't make stupid jokes when you're a queen. And now, for one brief moment, she can be just as silly as every other young person in the country. 22-year-old Jean Campbell Harris, now Baroness Trumpington, was also out in the crowds on VE night. She'd spent the war years working at the government's code-breaking headquarters at Bletchley Park. We sort of knew that the end was nigh, so we had to judge it pretty carefully because we were certainly not going to be separated that night. Uh, and so we all dashed up to London by train. <laughs> After the long, dark years of blitz and blackouts, the capital was finally coming back to life. Lights, lights, people, lights. You didn't give a damn uh, of how much light there was. Windows with lights showing. Oh. By 10.30 p.m., Princess Elizabeth and her sister had made it to Trafalgar Square. As the numbers on the streets continued to swell, the royal group was getting up close and personal with complete strangers. Trafalgar Square was jammed from end to end. It was a scene of joyful whoopee, and everybody was laughing and shouting and crying and um, kissing policemen and kissing other people and 
you know, generally mayhem. <laughs> but, but a rather nice mayhem. For many out celebrating that night, falling into the willing arms of another was the most natural thing in the world. I had sort of picked up this naval commander who did quite a lot of dancing around with me and quite a lot of kissing, but that was it. Bye-bye and never see you again. Um, and, but enjoy it while you may. I think that naval officer saved me from a lot of knicker trouble. You know, he looked after me. It, it was quite touching in a way because he... Um, you know, he, he did look after me. The crowds were continuing to swell as everyone fought for space on the streets. But King George VI hadn't sent his precious daughters out into the London night alone. One of those tasked with protecting them was his newest equerry, an RAF pilot by the name of Group Captain Peter Townsend. He had become equerry to the King um, and he was uh, not only absolutely charming, but he was a wonderfully brave sort of array of hero because he'd led the Pathfinder team who used to go in ahead of the bombers to find the targets in Germany. Um, and he was highly intelligent and, and, you know, would happily talk philosophy if one wanted him to. Um, and uh, so, Good-looking, glamorous, knowledgeable. Uh, it, it was a perfect person. Many women have said to me, of course, if I'd been there, I would have fallen in love with him. He was very attractive. And if you have a, a very attractive man who has served, as it were, you and your family, I'm thinking here of the princesses, served you and your family, uh, fought for you and your family, and whom you see every single day. And you are just, as Princess Margaret was, just reaching the age when you fall in love for the first time. It's almost impossible not to fall for someone like that. Probably everybody fancied him no end. <laughs> Although for his part, Townsend insisted he thought of Margaret as unremarkable, except for one feature. He saw this ebullient, gorgeous young girl, and I don't think he ever entertained any thoughts towards her that, other than that were completely respectable at that time. But he did talk about her having eyes the color of a tropical sea, which means he certainly noticed her. Margaret was 16 years younger than Peter Townsend, and their eventual love affair would cause a scandal in the coming years. But on VE Day, he was there to protect both princesses. And the dangers were all too real. Policemen on VE Day were given orders to turn a blind eye to troublemaking. And there were reports of drunken revelers being injured, falling from buses and lorries. The Queen's group was now heading straight for the most dangerous part of town, packed with drunken party-goers, Piccadilly Circus. There is a riotous aspect to this. There's a slightly dangerous aspect to it. This is, a, in a way, a moment of wonderful madness. But caught up in the chaos of the crowds, it was an area the royal group couldn't avoid. By 11pm on VE night, 
the numbers on the streets of London were reaching their peak. Most crowded of all was Piccadilly Circus. It was packed to bursting point with increasingly rowdy revellers. The king didn't want them to go to Piccadilly Circus because he was obviously worried that there would be a real crush there. So it's a central point. And he obviously thought they'll be fine as long as they keep on the outskirts of the crowd, which is actually what they did try to do. But they just got carried into the crowd. The future queen was now caught up in the seething mass with no obvious means of escape. Alongside her was her lady-in-waiting, Jean Woodruff. One didn't realize that one would be, you know, cheek by jowl, so to speak, with the people, lots of people standing, just roaring, really. Amazing. Well, the Queen knew she was going to be recognised. I mean, she'd been on the front of so many magazines. What she hoped was that people were so drunk, so excited, so over-thrilled, that they actually didn't think, who was that person just walked by me? She looked a bit like Princess Elizabeth. Couldn't have been. Having grown up in a privileged world, the two princesses would have been unprepared for some of the sights and sounds they encountered en route. For the princesses, it wasn't only the sheer numbers at Piccadilly Circus that were a novel experience. The area itself had something of a racy reputation, popular with American servicemen and their lady friends. The GIs frequented a club called Rainbow Corner, which was on uh, the corner of, of Piccadilly, near where the Criterion now is. And, of course, they had lots of dollars, chewing gum, silk stockings, um, delights of all kinds. And the camp followers appeared very shortly afterwards. The pavements were deep in them during the war. It was as if prostitution and the prostitution economy had taken off as never before. So around the Statue of Eros, on Piccadilly Circus. Um, that was where the Piccadilly Commandos went on duty. And they were sex workers who stood around the statue. And some of them would have little pen light torches that they would shine down onto their legs um, in order to show that they were wearing fishnet stockings. And it was almost like, you know, a kind of shop window, I guess. And the newspaper vendors would sell you a French letter. Um, they would have the, the supply of condoms behind, underneath the Evening Standard. And there was your night out with the Regent Palace Hotel just across Piccadilly Circus, only too happy um, to let you both walk through the doors, no questions asked. One of many Londoners who took advantage of this carefree wartime climate was Leo Zanelli. I lost my virginity and um, give or take a year, round about 1943, I was 13, 14. It was a fair-haired girl who was very nice, understanding, charming. Um, anyway, after I was finished talking among all the girls and uh, one, of the, one of the other girls volunteered, oh, she's a, she's a bus conductress who was a uh, was part-time prostitute, obviously. The war had a dramatic effect on people's attitude to sex. Inevitably, in a situation where you're, you think you may die at any moment, you don't sort of think, oh, well, I'll just postpone my fun, I'll do it next week. You do it now. Pre-war, there'd been a general feeling that uh, 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 most women should go undefiled to the marriage bed. That really got shelved to a quite a large extent. Um, even married women thought to themselves, well, my husband may not come back. Why am I waiting? For the upper classes too, the war changed the rules. By 
the royal group was passing close to a club known as the 400, a favorite haunt for some members of the party. It had a tiny little dance floor, which was lit with a spotlight. It had red velvet curtains, red silk walls. It had a very dusty vase of pink flowers, which had been there for an eternity and covered in dust. Um, but it had a little dance floor where we all danced very hugger-mugger. You had your own bottle, which was marked by the waiter when you'd finished drinking whatever it was, gin. The level was marked off, and that was absolutely rigorous. The bottle was kept whether you were away for five days or five years. The 400 Club also had a reputation for illicit encounters. I mean, you lived in a sort of dusky atmosphere where it was quite hard to see um, very clearly who else was there. But there was one famous moment when we all noticed that there were at least four dukes present, uh, and not with their duchesses. <laughs> I actually was a member, and I had been there once when my father was in one corner and both my brothers were in other corners, all with different people, and none of us took any notice of the people we were with. We all stared at my father, who was very, very embarrassed and didn't last very long with his lady friend, who was not my mother. The 400 Club was part of a secret landscape of nightclubs and hotels across the wartime West End, which operated as drinking dens and dance halls for aristocrats like those in the royal group. These institutions look for, for safe places in which pleasure could be had, um, places that could be reinforced, places that would be, in effect, bomb-proof as far as they could make them. And so the Grand Hotels became um, five-star air raid shelters for plutocrats, business people, aristocrats, whose staff had all gone off rather thoughtlessly to fight the Second World War. <laughs> On VE night, one particular group of aristocrats was discovering how ordinary people partied. By 11.30 p.m., the future queen had become just a face in the crowd, laughing and joking and dancing. There was a lot of dancing, including the conga, of course, which was lovely because it meant a lot of people who didn't know each other could all join in. At around 11.30, the Queen and her friends began to dance their way down Piccadilly. Then, finding themselves outside London's grandest hotel, someone had a brilliant idea. Well, for some reason, we decided to go in the front door of the Ritz and do the conga. It gave them da 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 bum ba da 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 bum Da, 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 taking your leg out. You know. So they get in this line and they go singing and dancing through the Ritz. So you've got all these, these people who are staying in the Ritz, these people who are having dinner there, suddenly surrounded by this mad group of posh young people. That was a good moment, really, because the Ritz has always been so stuffy and, and formal and everything else, you know. So I think we rather electrified the stuffy individuals inside. <laughs> which was um, extremely enjoyable. There were people having tea. Well, I don't think they realised who, who, was, who was amongst the party. I think they just thought were a lot of rather drunk young mad people. <laughs> All I can really remember is sort of old ladies looking faintly shocked. And little did those people know that the Queen, the future Queen, was in that group, waving and shouting and making just as much noise as the rest of them. And as one conga through, um, the eyebrows were raised, and what are these people up to, you know? <laughs> Which we paid no attention, of course. The conga is a very particular sort of silly dance. Um, and everybody together, everybody doing the same thing, and everybody um, feeling the same thing. So it's one 
big family. And in, in a way, she's looked at the British people, the, the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth as one big family ever since. By 11.45 p.m. on VE night, the Queen had been partying along with her people on the streets of London for over two hours. As midnight approached, it was time to head back to the safety of Buckingham Palace. But to get home, Elizabeth and her group would need to find their way through what was then one of London's most notorious areas. There were places like Green Park and St James's which one would never have walked through night in the war. And uh, there we were. During the war, Green Park had become well known for its dubious nocturnal activities. As they made their way through the park, Elizabeth and her friends at first saw nothing out of the ordinary. Well, the usual thing, I suppose, of people kissing and hugging. But then, she got something of a surprise. And even making love. I think I was shocked by it. Because I, had, I hadn't experienced that sort of thing before happening in public. And I'm sure the princesses had never seen anything fornicating other than perhaps animals. On their VE night excursion, the young princesses had witnessed a unique moment in Britain's history, marked by an outpouring of excess after years of austerity. When we think of VE Day, we get the picture post image of it, don't we? People swinging off the, off the lamp posts. This is, a, in a way, a moment of wonderful madness. Um, and it's a, it's a moment of hysteria, too. The day after VE Day, um, piles of burnt deck chairs in Green Park and condoms in all the bushes. It was now after midnight. After three hours, Princess Elizabeth, Princess Margaret and their entourage had completed a five-mile round trip through London and made it back to Buckingham Palace. And at the palace, we, we joined the, these huge crowds that were jammed up against the railings and we stood with them. We managed somehow to wheedle our way to the front and we um, all, the crowd was shouting and we joined in with we want the king, we want the king. In later years, the queen didn't mind admitting she had pulled some strings to give the people what they wanted. And we were successful in seeing my parents on the balcony, having cheated slightly because we sent a message into the house to say we were waiting outside. And they came out and they, they, you know, we, we were able to join the crowd in shouting hooray, hooray. That one night, everybody was together. Everybody wanted the same thing. Everybody was celebrating. And she was part of this wonderful camaraderie. Elizabeth's once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to mingle freely with her future subjects had come to an end. In the future is a lifetime of royal duty and decorum and never speaking your mind. She has one chance to go wild, and that was VE night, because after that, everything changed. Labour will
will now have a majority over all parties in a house of 640. Just weeks after VE Day, a Labour government was voted in, and the war leader Churchill was out. Newspapers carried the astonishing news to an amazed public, and slowly the model of it all struck home. Labour landslide. At the Savoy Hotel, one woman was heard to say, they've elected a Labour government, and the country will never stand for that. Britain looked to the future, but the future was going to look very different. Because people were used to living in a more regulated way and used to the state playing a larger role in their lives, um, that, that uh, permitted a kind of reorganisation of British society after the war. Um, the, the welfare state and the NHS are the most obvious examples of that. For someone as young as Princess Elizabeth, she was incredibly politically aware. And she knew there was going to be a huge sea change once the war was over. Every institution in the country was having to adapt to the new world, and the royal family was no exception. In 1947, on her 21st birthday, Elizabeth set out the kind of monarchy she wanted to create for post-war Britain. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. When Elizabeth gave her 21st birthday dedication to the pe people of the Commonwealth, she really meant it. This duty, which is hard for people to understand now, but duty was the all-abiding rule of the monarchy. Elizabeth's duties were clear. In this egalitarian age, she would have to be a monarch who served her people. But without an official role, her sister Margaret had to forge her own path. Princess Elizabeth was always the more serious and um, thinking one, you know. Margaret was always the larky one, which was fine, I mean, you know, because she could be very funny and she could make anybody laugh if she was set her heart on it. She's going to have fun, she's going to be a bit naughty, she's going to smoke, she's going to drink, she's going to be popular and dance all night and a little bit bohemian. One of the bars Margaret frequented was the American bar at the Savoy Hotel. Victor Gower served both princesses during his time as a bartender at the Savoy. Well, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, they come here occasionally uh, with a crowd, um, normally about eight. And uh, they'd always have their set table. There were absolutely no bother to serve at all. Princess Elizabeth would normally drink gin and tonic. You got the impression she wasn't a big drinker at all, because uh, she nursed her drinks. But Princess Margaret was whiskey. That was her favourite. Whiskey and a cigarette. Oh, yeah, she liked her drink and her cigarettes. And obviously, I just think it shortened her life a bit. I would imagine so. It was a shame because, you know, she was a lovely person, beautiful to look at. But, um, I don't know. She was a bit unhappy, I think. As well as becoming a party animal, Princess Margaret also embarked on an ill-advised love affair with the dashing pilot Peter Townsend, who escorted her on their jaunt through the capital. Townsend was divorced, making it unthinkable at that time that he and Margaret could marry. When they finally revealed their love for each other, it created a dilemma for Queen Elizabeth. The difficulty for the Queen, of course, was on was twofold. One, she was head of the Church of England, so she had a certain responsibility, well, a very strong responsibility as to, you know, what was right and wrong, and this was clearly wrong. And the other thing was that she wanted her sister to be happy, and those two things were cast very much in contradiction, I think. Ultimately, Margaret's relationship with Peter Townsend was doomed to fail. 
In the post-war world, Margaret struggled to find a role serving the people the way Elizabeth had. I think that the, um, the difference between the, the Queen and Princess Margaret was that the Queen is, is absolutely, totally dedicated and will always put her duty first. But there were certainly times in, in her later life when Princess Margaret um, did sometimes, as it were, disappoint the general public and if she wasn't feeling up to something, she would not hesitate to cancel it. Later in her life, Margaret was to suffer almost 20 years of ill health before passing away in 2002. For the Queen, everything came second to upholding a life of duty and a dignified monarchy. Elizabeth has been Queen and served her country for over 60 years. In 2015, she will become Britain's longest reigning monarch. But perhaps the defining feature of her reign is still the fact that the Queen is a member of a unique generation. A generation who survived the war and celebrated the peace together on the streets of London 70 years ago. It was a very privileged thing to have done and I always have thought you know, that I was very lucky to have been able to do that. For the many thousands out on the streets on VE Day, perhaps it was most significant for Princess Elizabeth, as it marked the end of an era and the beginning of a new world. It was a, a, a moment for her to somehow sample something along with all the other people that eventually she was going to govern. The interview shows that this was a night that would live with her forever. I think it was one of the most memorable nights of my life. <laughs>